Well, the really dramatic example that everyone's going to be familiar with is the Milgram experiments from the 1960s. So I presume most of you are familiar with this uh, very famous research in which you would take ordinary people, uh, bring them into a lab, and in the upshot, in the course of about 20 or 30 minutes, you could get them to voluntarily kill an innocent person. Now, I can, let's say a little bit more about that. Um, <laughs> and then I'll give you the other study. Uh, so what happened is you bring this person into the lab. Uh, you say, I want you to administer a test to someone who's in the next room. And for every wrong answer that this person gets, I want you to turn this dial up a little bit more and administer. Uh, the dial is going to give a little shock every time there's a wrong answer. And the more wrong answers, the more you have to turn the dial up, the more shock this person's going to get. And as it goes along, it's all, of course, rigged. This is all staged. Um, there really is no shock going on. The person in the other room is an actor. But the participant doesn't know that. They think it's real. And so as time goes on, there are more and more wrong answers. And so there's more pressure to turn the dial up. And the dial has numbers on it. And the final uh, reading is XXX, the lethal dosage of shock. And lo and behold, um, what happens? Let me, before I tell you that, add another wrinkle to it. There was the participant, there was a person in the other room, and then there was a scientific looking individual in a lab coat who was in the room with the participants. And anytime there was any kind of squeamishness or objection or something like that, this uh, scientific looking person would say, please continue. You must go on. We need these results. And the upshot was, uh, 66% typically um, would end up turning the dial all the way to the XXX level and killing, so they thought, this test taker in the other room. Despite earlier uh, the test taker screaming in pain, pounding on the walls, saying, I have a heart condition, it didn't matter. The dial was turned up all the way to the XXX level. So the underlying idea, and I'll, I'll try and wrap it up, <laughs> sorry, um, is that uh, powerful impetus to obey an authority figure led these ordinary participants to voluntarily kill an innocent person. That doesn't sound too good to me. I don't know what you think about that. Um, that doesn't sound too good to me. I mean, I'm going to come back in a yeah. moment, and we can get to your other example. But, yeah. but I, Heather, what I, do you think? Sort of, yeah, just a sort of a, not, not a counter argument, but a, I guess a caveat. I mean, the thing that, that I think that this study, I mean, it was looking at obedience to authority. And how, and, and there's a couple of points here. Not everybody did it, right? So what did you say? It was 66%, right? right. So, um, you know, there's a lot of things, a lot of uh, psychological aspects to what goes into when, you, when and when not to obey authority. And there are people who have varying degrees in which they do obey. And so I don't think that this study in particular is a, a great example of saying that we are innately immoral. I just think that some of us are more, um, you know, uh, vulnerable to authority than others. There, you know, to counter argue that, you know, there's these studies by Karen Wynn at Yale with children looking at babies having to sort of make moral decisions. And, you know, they're looking at puppets, and one puppet is sort of a bad puppet, which kind of doesn't help out the puppet in the middle, and the other one is a good one that does help them out. And then afterwards, these three month year old, I mean, three month old babies are can choose which stuffed animal they want to play with, and 90% of the time they go with the good one. And then when they're offered cookies by the good and the bad one, and the bad one has more cookies than the good one, they'll still take the one cookie from the good one. So there are these, if you're talking about innate morality, you know, at such a young age, at three months old, they're making these, you know, morally sort of good decisions. So I think that's just a counter argument. I like the one where he, she, the, the baby slapped the bad the puppet. Uh, yes, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so Michael, they do you want to weigh in here? Are yeah, we, well, are we more a, innately good yeah, or bad? I, I did a replication of uh, Milgram's experiments here in New York with uh, Chris Hansen and I did this for Dateline NBC. We did seven subjects. We just had one day in this rented studio. And it was a, it was a faux um, reality television show. It's really easy to get people in New York to <laughs> participate in what they think is going to be on TV. Anyway, so um, uh, actually what we saw in our subject, we actually built the, 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 exactly the Milgram shock box with the toggle switches, 15 volts at a time, and, and so on. But what you, you saw in every one of our, well, our first subject, this woman said, you said you're going to do what? <laughs> I'm out of here. And, uh, and then the other six went various degrees up. Um, but they were really not happy about this. They were anxious about it. You could tell that the, you know, their heart rates were you know, elevated. They were uh, you know, struggling all the way. Are, are you sure? I really don't want to do this. I'm really uncomfortable with this. Can we go check on him? 
you know, that you could see that they had a moral sense, all of them. And that, so really, uh, another way to just rephrase it is like, we have a good nature that you can, you can twist and make go in a different direction under certain conditions. Well, it also makes me wonder, if you just did this experiment recently, and when was, what was the year was the Milgram? 60s. I mean, maybe we've become a lot more skeptical well, about authority. Well, the only guy to actually replicate it uh, legally, because <laughs> we, uh, we didn't have to get the approval of a, a research board. We just had to get the approval of NBC lawyers to say, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we won't get sued and have the subject sign all these waivers. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> uh, but um, uh, Jerry Berger at uh, Portland State uh, uh, di did it up to 150 volts, which was the point at which uh, in Milgram's original experiments, right. the subjects would bail out or not, or, or go all the way. And he found a significant, a, a lower percentage of participants that went that far. And so maybe that's a little bit of the bending of the moral arc. There's also the effect that, who hasn't heard of the Milgram experiments? Uh, I was amazed at the subjects we had. They were younger, so maybe they hadn't had that class yet or something like that. Well, let me, let me. But, but, <laughs> but, but the way to phrase it is that instead of, is it, you know, is it nature, nurture, are we good or evil? We're both, yes, we have a, a great range of capacity and how you tweak the variables, the dials, uh, the social conditions in which you put somebody, you can get them to, to do bad or good. I mean, there's studies of, of, uh, of the Nazi Eitzansgruppe and uh, these special action forces in the East after the Vermont uh, went through uh, to the invasion of the Soviet Union. And their job, these special action forces, was to kill all the Jews in every one of these towns. And it turns out this was not an easy task for the leaders to get the soldiers to do. They had to introduce them at you know long range, and then close range, they, and, and many of the men got sick, violently ill. They didn't want to do it, and, and they had to impose a lot of conditions to get them to go all the way. Now, yes, of course, there's some that enthusiastically did it, but most, you know, they weren't super comfortable doing it. They, they had that sense of I shouldn't be doing this, but here's a bunch of conditions that say it's okay, and then and then with habituation, you can get them to do it a lot more. And also rationalization. Yeah. I mean, a lot of times, I think even the the, the, the Nazi leaders who were doing it, you know. Know, willingly and whatnot, we're believing. I mean, if you even take, you know, the the, the terrorists now, you know, there there is this convi conviction that I am doing the right thing in their mind. So it's that, not. That, that's right. They they think they're being moral, not immoral. Yeah. Yes, so exactly. so and Christian, you wanted to jump yeah, in here. So I threw out something provocative. Let me now kind of backtrack a little bit. So <laughs> don't label me as holding this really extreme view, um, just based on one study. Um, so let me let me give a little bit more nuanced picture of what I'm thinking. Uh, so a couple of quick side notes first. Um, a recent replication of Milgram, we funded through the Character Project, used a virtual reality simulation of the Milgram study. Um, oh. And so we could recreate the whole thing, but with a, a virtual reality avatar as the test taker as opposed to a real person. Found the same kind of pattern of results. Very interesting research. We also funded research on uh, young children finding the same kind of fairness dispositions and tendencies, uh, wanting to play with fair people as opposed to unfair people, even at uh, nine months old. So I, I agree with that too. My overall view is not that um, uh, because we're not good, that means we're kind of wretched people, vicious people, horrendous people. So I want to, don't, don't jump to that conclusion. I think I agree with what's been said here. It's a much more of a balanced picture. So I don't think the Milgram experiments, for example, show that we are vicious. Why? Well, here's one reason. Uh, a vicious person, according to Aristotle, is someone who is wholehearted, single-minded in pursuing something. But as this particular study, as you mentioned, showed, uh, people were of two minds about it. They were kind of conflicted and torn, and, and they felt a lot of guilt about it. Uh, so that's, that's one reason. But then there are all these really powerful studies pointing in the opposite direction. So not that we're uh, just going to do these um, kind of problematic things, morally speaking, but that we're also, in other situations, quite disposed to do morally tremendous things, powerful things, and for admirable motives, too, because motivation is really important to moral behavior, not just I mean, to the evaluation of a person and to someone's character, not just their action. So uh, uh, research on empathy uh, done by Dan Baston and others, uh, I find it very convincing in showing that we, uh, in addition to kind of aggressive capacities, and other problematic capacities. We also have uh, empathetic capacities to help others for selfless, altruistic reasons.